following program is sponsored by Friends of Life Outreach International. When Jesus expressed his emotional pain, he never held it back. Mm. He didn't apologize. Mm. He never repented. He cried in front of the tomb of Lazarus. Yes. In front of people. Trauma therapist Dr. Anita Phillips reminds us that the emotions God created us to have are good for us. Just because you have faith for the outcome doesn't mean you don't have pain in the process. Amen. And Jesus expressed yes. the pain of the process okay. because he was wearing a human body. Next. Everybody, I'm Tammy Trent. Welcome to Life Today. I'm so glad you're here with us today because we have Dr. Anita Phillips with us and she has a brand new book out that hit the New York Times bestsellers list titled The Garden Within, where the war with your emotions ends and your most powerful life begins. And it is so, so good. So listen, today is a day you're gonna want to take notes. I promise you the time is gonna go by so, so fast. So lean in, grab a piece of paper and a pen, because Dr. Anita is not only a licensed therapist, but also a minister of God's word. And she has so much to teach us today about all of it and the garden within. Welcome, Thank Dr. You. Anita. It's Thank so great to me. have you here. I'm so happy Man, to be here. We're gonna have to unpack so much so quickly today because I feel like I'm just gonna wind you up and just let you go because you're <laughs> unbelievable. Oh, this book has meant so much to me. It's gonna be something I'm gonna go back to many times throughout the year and, and revisit. And I think many people are gonna feel the same, but I wanna start first by unpacking just a little bit about your life, your journey, and how you even got to this place of, of wanting to be a trauma therapist. Yeah, I think that everybody in trauma therapy got there because of their own trauma. Mm. I think we're kind of led by our pain to find that healing for ourselves and for other people. And for me, it began in childhood. I'm a pastor's kid, pastor's grandkid, but that wasn't the trauma. Uh, <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> I'm sure, I, can't, I was really yes. blessed in that area. Good. But I had an older sister who developed the symptoms of a serious mental illness when she was still very young. Mm -hmm. And so we shared a bedroom and when I was about six and she was about 11 or 12, she woke up in the middle of the night one night screaming, just screaming and her mm -hmm. eyes were wide open. She's staring at our bedroom door and she said, Nita, there's a demon in the door. And so, well, hey, this is a real possibility, right? We right. are Christians. Yeah. We right. understand spiritual yep. attacks and warfare. And yep. so I thought maybe that's really true, but it's still terrifying. And my parents heard her screaming. They woke up, they came, they prayed and eventually she peeked at the door and she didn't see this demon anymore and we thought that's it it's done but in the weeks and the months to come it would happen again and again and it became kind of hard for me to sleep I had a certain anxiousness that I would wake up to these screams and so that was an early trauma for me and eventually it did seem to quiet but actually what happened was someone in the neighborhood introduced her to drugs and she found out that it quieted the voices we didn't know she was hearing it stopped the hallucinations and that's too much for any child to resist of yes. course that torment being quieted and so unfortunately she became addicted to those drugs and lost decades of her life in the streets. And so as I'm growing up watching my parents minister to others, but weep at home about what was going on with my older sister, Valerie, uh, I wanted to know what is happening here. And yes. so I was led into this field okay. um, to explain how people suffer, how they break, how we get better. But I also had a persistent question for God. What does your Bible teach us? about human behavior, about the understanding of who we are, how we were made, because he's the creator. Right. And uh, I was told by lots of smart people that the Bible didn't speak to these things, but I never believed it. And it turns out I was right to trust yes. God because yes. it's in the book. I am so glad you didn't believe it. I and didn't I'm believe so it for a minute. glad you dug <laughs> in. And you talk so much about emotions, mm -hmm. which is a, a huge topic for me because I'm an emotional girl. Good. Right? We I, are. And I love that. A therapist <laughs> said good to my emotions. Yes. I love that so much because I think I've been told so many times in my life, you're too emotional. Uh, suppress your emotions. Don't be so emotional, but I feel like I've, all, and I don't even know how it developed if it's just always been there. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can tell me today and I can send you a check. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like I always say like my emotions are right here and so is my giggle, mm -hmm. like my joy. It's it's so close to the surface all the time. Uh, but, but what do you say to somebody 
that that has been told like your emotions are bad mm -hmm. how do you and you went into the word of god to find out are they bad are they good did jesus have emotions jesus was extremely emotional <laughs> and this is what was so exciting about this journey because even though i was in scripture trying to understand my sister's illness the holy spirit and all his wisdom took me to understand wellness okay. what did it look like for us to be well you can't fix something that's broken if you don't know what it looked like before it broke mm -hmm. otherwise you're just guessing and a lot of times it's like in psychology and as professionals, without God's insight, we're guessing yeah. on what it means to be well. And what the Lord showed me was that he designed us like gardens. When I was taking a neuroscience class in grad school for the first time, I saw a picture of a neuron okay. and that neuron looked like a seedling. And I was so shocked. I said, man, if I really believe in the God of my Sunday school book that created the heavens and the earth, who made plants on day three and us on day six, I can't avoid the truth of these plants and neurons looking alike. Yeah. And so I believed that God was being intentional because that's his character. And so I dove into scripture saying, why would he talk about plants the way he does with us? We'll be like a tree planted by rivers of water. I'll plant you in a good land. Yes. Isaiah 58, 11 says, you'll be a well-watered garden. Yes. I said, oh my gosh, he really meant it. Because inside of us, our nervous system is modeled after plants and we are gardens. And in the parable of the sower, Jesus puts all the pieces together. Okay. He talks about a sower going out and sowing seeds. Those seeds are words. They fall on soil. Jesus says the soil is the heart. And depending on the emotional state, Jesus describes the different soil types based on joy, anger, fear. Depending on the emotional state, the seed's growth is affected. Then the plant, that's the mind. That's why neurons look like plants. And then the fruit is what we do. Seed, soil, plant, fruit, words, feelings, thoughts, behaviors. It's that simple. And so when we recognize that the heart is the soil of our lives, then that means what's going on with me emotionally, my emotional well-being affects every word spoken. Mm. God's word, my words to my children, our words to ourselves, every word spoken falls on the soil of our heart and our emotional well-being determines what happens to those words. And so the heart is the soil of your life. And we have seen emotions as a problem, right. as something to separate ourselves yes. from. And people love to quote the scripture. Well, the Bible says the heart is desperately wicked. I'm like, slow down. Yeah. It's one verse. Okay. And we're taking it out of context. That's in the book of Jeremiah. And we ignore that later in the book of Jeremiah, God says, I'm going to give you a new heart. Yes. I'm going to exchange your heart. So we're not walking around with desperately wicked hearts, especially if we know Jesus. Wow. Then we've had that exchange. And so paying attention to where we are emotionally affects everything else in our lives. My goodness, Dr. Nia, there's so many things that, that you cover just like that in the book. The heart is de deceitful. There's so many things that are, to me, like... Um, like, like moments that will set people free. Yes. That we've hung on to certain things, taken it out of context, Good and it's bound us. Bad context. Yes, yes, and it will set you free. Yeah. There are so many things about your book, and, and I've written down so many different things. Okay. Chapter one, you had me out of the box, girl. <laughs> I'm gonna read this. I grew up believing that I was meant to, to harness the power of my mind to live well, and that emotions were nice, but were more often problematic. Okay, so. I love that you have given me permission to say it's okay to be emotional. We are all emotional. Some of us are just less in touch with it than others. <laughs> How do we keep it intact? Mm -hmm. How do we do that? How do we balance those things? Is, is balance even a word? Are we fighting for wellness in our lives? You know, I want us to take off all of the restrictive words we use for okay. emotion. Balancing it, managing it, because we're presenting it as if it's a problem. Your heart is the soil of your life. If a plant, and imagine your mind is the plant, if a plant is wilting, or a plant needs nourishment, what do you do? You water the soil. Yeah. You don't spray the plant. You put the fertilizer in the soil, not on the plant. So in the same way, we go to our hearts. When the soil is dry again next week, nobody gets mad at soil. Mm. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I have to water this soil again. This soil has to be managed. Well, we just give it what it needs. We expect it to need. Yes. The same thing is with our hearts. Our hearts, our emotional pain um, gives us information about what we need. When we're sad, we need connection. We're yes, hungry we for it. When yes. we are angry, it's usually because we need value and worth to be applied to something important and someone has done, not done that. When we're afraid, we need to feel safe. The emotion of fear is a human emotion. It's saying I need safety. So just like when I'm hungry, I need food. Humans need food and water to survive, but we need connection and worth and safety. Yes. And our emotional pain is a hunger pang. 
yes. for those things. Okay. When we ignore those needs, eventually we find ourselves unwell. And we yes. never saw Jesus do it. I want to point that out because yes. I know so many people who know Jesus are listening. When Jesus expressed his emotional pain, he never held it back. Mm. He didn't apologize. Mm. He never repented. He cried in front of the tomb of Lazarus. Yes. In front of people. Public tears. Emotional. Emotional. And some people say, oh, well, he's sad that his friend died. And some said that he's sad that he was thinking of his own death. Whatever the reason it was, they weren't tears of joy. It was he emotional. was crying. Yes. Even though he knew mm. he was about to raise Lazarus from the dead. Even though he knew. Why then? Why? His father was going to raise him. Yes. Because just because you have faith for the outcome doesn't mean you don't have pain in the process. Amen. And Jesus expressed yes. the pain of the process okay. because he was wearing a human body. Okay. Just like us. We see him. So li listen, we go tears at Lazarus's tomb, raises him from the dead. We see him flipping tables in the temple when he's angry. I mean, he really yes, went off. That's right. And then people flow into the temple and he heals their bodies. In Gethsemane, we see him distressed beyond measure. He's crying out to God. The book of Hebrews says with loud crying and tears, he sought his father who could save him from death. He's really crying. And then a few minutes later, after he's strengthened, he walks down and says, I am he to the mm. soldiers who came to get him and knocked them off his feet. Every time Jesus had an emotional breakdown, yep. he had a breakthrough, yes. something miraculous yes. happened. And we are holding in all of our pain. Oh. And I think we are aborting our breakthrough because we're not releasing the pain oh, and allowing man. the spirit to flow behind us just like Jesus did. That is so good. I love how you talk about that, the breakthrough and, and coming on the other side of yes. that. Oh my gosh, what would you say to the person that has been told that you don't have enough faith because you're, you're, you're showing emotion. Uh, this, this pain hurts, so you're crying. So you're not believing enough Listen. that God can turn this around. Why, you, you have no faith. What do we say to people like that? I would say, am I required to have more faith than Jesus? Because Jesus was crying. Why didn't Jesus just walk into Gethsemane like, hey, it's crucifixion day, but I know I have the victory. He did not. No. He did not. He expressed the pain of what it meant to be in that human body. And we're allowed to do that too. But we have allowed culture's view of emotion. Our Western culture, some of the Greek philosophies that have informed the way we approach Christianity, the approach the scripture, where the thought was emotion is bad to show, the mind is more important. And we have absorbed that into our theology. But that doesn't reflect the Jesus that I see in that book. No. And so we have to be very careful, not only in studying scripture in the context where it was written, but paying attention to the context where it's being read. Why am yes. I reading it and not having seen this emotional Jesus before? Yes. We have to shed yes. our cultural lens. I never did. I never did. We weren't taught to see it. We have certain cultural blinders on. And that alone set me free. Just reading that, like, yes. oh, if Jesus was emotional, yes. then I'm okay to have you some emotions. You are good. And when we miss it, we oh. don't care for the soil. Oh, and then yeah. the seeds fall and are not, the power of the seeds are not unleashed because the soil isn't ready for them. And not because we have painful emotions, but because we don't allow them to flow through and out. Yes. It is okay to feel all of the feelings. Hebrews 4.15 says, we have not a high priest who cannot be touched by the feelings, feelings of our infirmities and that he was tempted in every way, but he never sinned. So that means no feeling in itself can be a sin because if Jesus felt everything we felt and he never sinned. What about anger? Anger is not a sin. What does Ephesians say? Be angry and sin not. It doesn't okay. say don't be angry so you won't sin. It says be angry and sin not. Anger oh, can push yes our behavior, and so we need to pay attention to that, but a lot of times we don't even want to touch that we're angry, but it's under there, just boiling, just oh, boiling, girl. <laughs> just boiling, and then we say, I lost my temper. No, you've been holding it in so long. Oh my goodness. It's okay to be angry. There, are, There is things that we should righteously be angry about. Goodness, but yes. But when we hold it in, you know what? It makes us sick. Yeah. It oh. undermines our immune system. Yeah. We're more likely to get ill. Yeah. And so our bodies, our hearts, our spirits, our minds, everything's meant to work together, but this obsession with the mind. It's the original sin. Isn't that what mm. the first woman and then the first man did? Oh, if I eat this fruit, I'll be wise like God. I'll be able to think yes. like God. It was a pursuit of the mind. If she had just, if that first woman had just kept his word hidden in her heart, instead of thinking about what she could do with her mind. Oh my gosh. How do we understand <laughs> mental wellness mm -hmm. through the scripture? Th this is also what I love so mm. much about your book, it is so 
It is so sound, biblically sound, mm, practical. You. There's so much science in here where I'm like, she's she's sending me back to school. <laughs> there's so much stuff. And it's just wrapped around so many scriptures, the word of God. It's solid. It's There's a revelation, mm. a bit of a revival yes. in your life that can happen if you tap into the truth of what you are speaking of. Yes. This, is, this is stuff you've researched, you've studied. This girl knows what she's talking <laughs> about. So how do we understand even, you know, mental wellness right now, it's mm -hmm. a big thing. Mm -hmm. We've walked through a lot the last few years. We and have. I think many people are struggling with mental wellness, mental illness even. Like yes. how do we navigate through that in scripture? Absolutely, it is in there. Everything is in that book. I take you to Romans 7 and we look at Paul who wrote most of the mind scriptures we yeah. quote, talking about how he himself struggled. In the second half of that chapter, he's talking about what I don't want to do, I do want, I don't, what I do want to do, I don't. We all know right? those verses, yes. right? And we talk about that in terms of trying not to commit acts of sin. But I think Paul was talking about an internal struggle mm. because Paul himself in other passages says that touching the law, he was blameless, perfect, like he was righteous according to the law. So it's hard for me to believe if he never broke a law of God before he met Jesus on the Damascus road, that after that he was struggling to like what, not go out and party? I think something else was happening. Right. He says that there was the law of God in his mind, but that there was another law in his body, his members, mm. warring against the law of his mind. And he said, sometimes it takes my mind captive so yes, Paul wrote all those verses about the mind, but he also vulnerably acknowledged that sometimes something in his body was doing something his mind wishes it wouldn't. And I believe he was struggling with internal feelings. I believe he struggled with anxiety and you'll have to get the book to read that. Yes. But he admits that sometimes something in his body was stronger than his volitional mind. And that's what mental illness is. There are times when our body and our brain, which your brain is part of your body, malfunctions in a way that overcomes how you want to feel. My sister didn't want to have hallucinations. She didn't want to hear voices. Nobody wants to be in the grips of depression for weeks. Right. Nobody right. wants to be um, suffering with a bipolar disorder, but something happens in the body, just like high blood pressure or diabetes, that can overtake what I want to do, what mm. I choose, how I wish I could feel. Mm. And that's not making excuses, it's real. Real. And so we have to understand that if Paul acknowledged that there are times when my body overthrows my volitional choice, that is certainly going to happen to us. And that is all that mental illness is. Something in my body is broken mm. and it is overthrowing my volitional mind. But here's the beautiful part. At the end of chapter seven in Romans, Paul laments this. He says, oh, this body of death. But then he goes straight on and says, but there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That's the very next verse. That's the very next verse. Amazing. So there's no condemnation if None. your human body breaks in a way that struggles against your mind. Jesus still lives within you. Hallelujah. And he goes right on through that whole chapter eight. He says that we are victorious, yes. that we are more than conquerors. Yes. And he ends it by saying, what can separate us from the love of God? What? Nothing. Not a thing. Nothing. No diagnosis. No. No symptom. No pain. No, no illness. Whatever is going on with you. Jesus knows how you feel. Yes. You are not condemned. Mm -hmm. And as long as you keep your attention in his direction, go to therapy, take medication, whatever you need, mm -hmm. you are loved by God. Girl. There's no condemnation. Oh my gosh, that's powerful stuff right there. I have so many other things. Go, go. I have so many other things. <laughs> Let me just give this one, one quote and just tell me something quickly about it. There's a couple of things. I've Never choose an answer that limits God. Yes. I love when you say that trauma may have shaped you, but it didn't make you. God made you, not your trauma. Maybe you haven't been formally diagnosed with depression, anxiety, or another mental health problem, but that doesn't mean that, you are, that your struggle isn't real in your mm -hmm. life. And why do we feel the way we feel about how we feel? Listen, when I was told the Bible is not meant for this, the Bible doesn't speak to biology and psychology. Let me tell you, when you'll see in this book, our very nervous system outline is mapped in that book. Yeah. Never choose an answer to limit that limits God. Say, I don't know before you say that God can't, didn't, or won't. That's good. Say, I don't Even know. Even right there, I don't know. I That's don't know. freeing in its sense. We always feel like we've got to have yes. the answer, but if you don't know, you don't know. That's it. I have loved this conversation. I wish we had uh, so much more time. You, you are amazing, but look, 
it, there, so many questions that I think people might even have is going to be in this book. It is. And, and I want to make sure to send you this book. But first, I want you to take a minute and watch this. And, and if God has laid it on your heart to partner with us in feeding children, which is our mission, then with whatever gift you can give today, I want to make sure to send you this book. And I'm telling you, it's going to be life changing. We're going to change a whole lot of lives out there in the mission field and here. Watch this. These orange bowls full of vitamin-enrich soup are dished up daily to thousands of children in the school feeding program. This is why we can say mission feeding saves lives. And because of mission feeding, we're saving lives in other ways. In areas hit by natural disasters, our mission partners are answering the call with emergency food distribution efforts. Mission Feeding also provides malnutrition clinics, therapeutic milk for children who cannot tolerate solid food. And we distribute boxes of food packs to clinics so mothers can feed their children as they struggle to survive the ravages of malnutrition. Maria de Fatima is a mother who benefited from Mission Feeding. Maria took her son, Zasia, who was suffering from malnutrition, to a rural clinic near her village where he was given food. As Maria shared her story with John Yates, Zasia decided he would come in and join the activity. So he just came in from playing. And the fact is, this little boy was severely sick just a few months ago. And he's able to play today because Maria can receive food rations from the malnutrition clinic. But the reality for mothers in countries like Angola is the mortality rate among children under five is the highest in sub-Saharan Africa. And a major contributing factor for their deaths is malnutrition. Children like Zasia can only be saved if we continue mission feeding. And so I'm asking you, would you help us? Would you help us continue to help Maria? And would you help us help other mothers just like Maria? And God bless you for making a long journey here and come to my humble house. She's so, so sweet. And I love stories like this so much. Sasia's life was on the brink of despair, but through mission feeding, he was given a chance to thrive. And today, he's a living testament to the difference that we can make together in the lives of one child at a time. At Life Today, our purpose, it's clear to go where the need is, one life at a time, one village at a time. It's an honor and a calling for all of us here to be a blessing to those in need, just like Sasia. But we can't do this alone. We need your help today because there are countless others who need us right now. Today is a new day, and it brings with it a life that needs to be saved. The beautiful thing is, we're feeding 350,000 children every single day, but we wanna do more. We have to do more, because there's so many others that are waiting. They're standing in that line with that bowl right now, waiting for that bowl to be filled up, to receive sometimes their only meal of the day. So we have to get to them right now before it's too late, before they have to get to a place of going to a clinic where they have to fight even harder to live. So again, I'm asking if you would help us reach even more mothers just like Maria and to bring relief to so many families just like hers through Mission Feeding. Your gift, no matter how small, can make an enormous, enormous difference. You have to know that. So help us meet our goal of 350,000 children this year it breaks down this way, so anybody can help. $30 will feed three children for three full months. 50 will feed five. 100 will feed 10. And for those who can do more, well, 1,000 will help feed 100 children for three full months. You can make a difference today. So go online and call and make the best gift that you can. So let's work together to make every day a new opportunity to save lives together. We can continue to provide hope, to provide nourishment, and the chance at a better future for those that are in need right now. Right now, across the continent of Africa, children are suffering 
facing severe malnutrition and even death. Severe drought and famine, including in crisis areas like Ethiopia, means we must replenish food supplies immediately to keep feeding 350,000 children and help reach more people in desperate need. Through Life's Mission Feeding Outreach, your gift of love can be an answer to prayer for a hurting and hungry child in their time of need. Call now with your life-saving gift of $30, $50, or $100 to help feed and care for three, five, or 10 children for three full months. With your gift of any amount, we'll send the blessing of taking communion. In this book, discover how the sacred ordinance of communion helps to feed your soul and remind you of the transformative power of receiving the Lord's Supper. With your gift of $100 or more, you may request the Life Legacy Journal. This beautiful journal and pen will help you write your personal story and share the experiences that made you who you are. One day, the generations that follow will be able to look back and learn from the legacy you've left behind. Finally, with your gift of $1,000 or more to help feed and care for 100 children, be sure to request our inspiring bronze sculpture, A Cup of Water. Please call, write, or make your gift online today. You can be an enormous blessing right now today with any gift that you're able to give. Man, just go online or make a call to us and let us know that you'll be able to join with us in feeding these children. And don't forget to request this book, The Garden Within. We wanna make sure to send it to you with any gift that you give today. Dr. Anita, you are unbelievable. I appreciate you so much. God, you're yes. right, he's unbelievable. The Bible's unbelievable. It is, oh but gosh. his work in you Thank has you. now, has now overflowed into the lives of so many. So thank you for taking a risk and writing this book. And if you know someone who is struggling or you're struggling with the depths of your emotions and feeling overwhelmed with hurt, grief, anxiety, maybe panic attacks, trauma, depression, or fear, this is a book you need in your life. And just as Dr. Anita says, I'm gonna read this. You don't need to overthrow your emotions to experience a revolution in your life. You just need to overthrow the lies you have believed about your emotions. The creator designed your heart to be a garden, not a war zone. A truly powerful life isn't one, it's cultivated. And may we all learn how to take better care of our garden within, with intention and with purpose, and to, to end this war with the emotions of our lives and to embrace the powerful life we've been created for so much more. God bless you. We'll see you next time in Life Today. Next week on Life Today, Terry Christ encourages us to imitate Jesus' love for all of humanity, even those with differing viewpoints. Life Today is made possible by the supporters of Life Outreach International. Your gift will be used exclusively for the exempt purposes of life. The ministry features specific outreaches as examples of the programs it supports and conducts. Gifts are considered to be without restriction as to use unless explicitly stipulated by the donor. The ministry is a member of the ECFA.